This is the M4 iMac, Apple's sleek all-in-one desktop that might be the most underrated release of the year. On paper, it doesn't have the flashy Pro or Max chips, and yet for most people, it's got everything you need and maybe even more, but here's the real question. Is it worth spending $1,300 or $1,500 USD on this iMac when you could potentially buy the M4 Mac Mini at $599 and build out a setup around that? Today, I'm breaking down exactly why the M4 iMac might be the best option if you need to buy a completely new system, going over the benefits it has, how well it performs, and just how much you can get out of it. So if you're shopping for a new desktop Mac, or you want to know why the M4 iMac might be the best all-in-one computer for the price, stick around and let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Clean My Mac. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. The M4 iMac was probably the quietest release we saw out of all the new Macs announced this fall, but I still think it's a really underrated product. I know it doesn't get all the latest and greatest Pro or Max chips, but most people aren't going to need more than the base M series ones. And for a complete desktop solution, I don't think that you're going to find anything with this much value for the price. I know that might seem like an odd statement, given that the base Mac Mini starts at $599 USD and an iMac with a matching configuration starts at $1499, but let's just break down what you get with the iMac. Obviously, you get the computer itself, which in this case is going to be a 10-core M4 with 16 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD, which, for the sake of pricing this out, say is equal to the Mac Mini at $599. Then you have the included keyboard with Touch ID, that's $149, the Magic Mouse is $79, followed by what is essentially a smaller version of the Studio Display, which is a whopping $1599. Granted, the studio display is bigger at 27 inches versus 24 on the iMac, and usually a 3 to 4 inch size increase on a monitor can result in a 20 to 50% difference in price, but even if we cut the cost of the studio display in half, it would still be more expensive to buy all these things individually. Now, there are definitely components out there that you can buy that are cheaper, but they often aren't going to be the same level of quality, and there's a lot of intangibles that you get with an iMac that you just don't have piecing together a system yourself, starting with the design. The build quality on the iMac is outstanding. You've got a full aluminum body with a glass front panel, and there's not a piece of plastic in sight. Everything on it just feels premium down to the speaker grill on the bottom and the smooth motion of the stand hinge, and even though this design has been around for a few generations, I still find it quite impressive. You can obviously get the iMac in a variety of colors that have been updated slightly over the last generation, and I know that I'm gonna get asked why I chose silver out of all the fun colors there, and that's mostly due to circumstance more than anything. This Mac is actually going in my wife's office after I've reviewed it, and we're planning on doing some interior design updates, so a neutral tone like this is just a safer bet right now, but having seen all of these in person, my two favorites are the green and orange, but silver still does look great, and does fit into just about any space. Like I said, this is a model up from the base version, and comes in at $1499 USD, so not only do you get a slight bump in the chipset, but more importantly in my opinion is the amount of available Thunderbolt ports goes from 2 to 4, which from my own experience is kind of a must. Having only two ports is something that I used to struggle with on my old work Macs, where I'd have my phone plugged in running an app that I was developing on one port, and the other was used for a secondary monitor, which was always a pain to deal with if I ever needed to plug something in, say, if I ever had to charge my keyboard or mouse, so going up to 4 just gives you a lot more flexibility. This configuration also comes with a 1 gig Ethernet port, which the base version doesn't have, and I love that it's built directly into the power adapter, so even if you want a wired internet connection, you can potentially still only have one cable going to the iMac, as opposed to the half dozen or so you'd normally need with a standard PC. That just keeps things so much cleaner and minimal in my opinion, and you can get a lot out of this machine performance-wise as well with that 10-core M4 chip with 16 gigs of RAM. 
Comparing it to the same priced iMac I reviewed last year in benchmarks, you see about an 18% increase in single core performance and 22 in multi-core with about a 24% increase in GPU scores, which I would say is a reasonable difference, but not something that you'll notice every day in real world use. But doubling up the memory from eight gigabytes last year to 16 this year will have a far greater impact. Last year when I was testing out the M3 iMac with eight gigs of RAM, I did get quite a few out of memory warnings and I haven't got a single one since testing out this M4 iMac. Also, just a side note here, a lot of people have been asking in the comments about what tool I'm using to show RAM use and different specs on my machine. That is usually Clean My Mac, and if you look back on the channel, I've been using their products for years. There is a brand new version of Clean My Mac that is heavily centered around speed, performance, and efficiency, where not only can I access all these different performance and health metrics from the menu bar app, but inside the app itself, there's a host of features that I can use to optimize my Mac. At the top of the list is the Smart Care module, which streamlines all the key modules into one process. The cleanup module will identify junk files like outdated caches or trash, protection scans for malware and threats, performance boosts system performance by flushing caches and running maintenance scripts, applications checks for app updates, and my clutter frees up space by identifying unnecessary or duplicate files. Once scanned, you get a detailed breakdown of each module where you have full control over what you want to do with each one. And you can always run these specific functions individually from the sidebar if you want as well. I use a lot of the cleanup functionality in here and it's great to have peace of mind with threat detection. And for those wondering, having Clean My Mac running in the background uses virtually no system resources. If you want to check out Clean My Mac further, you can get 30% off through the link in the description for a limited time. So check that out if you're interested. Interested. Back to the iMac performance, at 16 gigs of RAM I can easily do graphic design, edit photos, and edit videos in Final Cut Pro without any issues. Editing last week's video of the new MacBook Pro on here along with making the thumbnail was a breeze without any hangups or slowness. And while some of the more resource heavy plugins and effects I use are a bit laggier than my M4 Pro machines, overall the base M4 chip has been more than capable. Similarly, small to medium sized software projects run and build just fine with minimal lag, and Xcode benchmark scores are about 27% faster than the M3 chip, but still 25% slower than the M4 Pro, but regardless, that's still pretty impressive and will beat some Pro Max from only a couple years ago. The only thing that I'll say about both coding and things like video editing is you're probably gonna wanna update the storage a little as 256 gigs won't get you very far in most cases. Just your system files alone are gonna eat up about 20 to 30 gigs of that. Xcode files and iOS simulators can easily go past 50 gigs and the same with games where they can fill up your storage very quickly. In this case, because this particular machine is going to be used with office software or for browsing the web and similar types of tasks, 256 is going to be fine, but for anything more than that, you'll likely want to bump that up to a minimum of 512 or at the very least have an external drive handy for offloading large files to. But outside of that, just in relation to CPU tasks, there isn't much the M4 can't do. Most of the time the iMac is dead silent, and the only time that I hear the fans kick on or that it gets hot is when I'm purposely stress testing the machine. And when you get into GPU heavy tasks like running Blender, it does start to fall behind in medium to large scenes, but simpler ones are totally fine. It renders out about 12% faster than the M3, but is a whopping 53% slower than the M4 Pro, which is to be expected with all the extra power in that chip. But surprisingly, this does work quite well with gaming. You're not going to be able to run most games at full resolution and super high settings or anything, and the fan's going to run almost constantly regardless of what you do there. But if you tone down the settings a little, at least on the titles that I have, things run pretty smoothly. The frame rates are decent, given that this isn't a gaming machine, enough that things are playable, and everything looks great on the iMac's retina display, which might be my favorite thing about this iMac. For me, having a color accurate monitor with a good overall picture is a must because I do a lot of color critical work and the M4 iMac is great in that regard. 
It's not the biggest display in the world, even though Apple refers to it as enormous, which is a bit of a stretch at 24 inches. But because it does have a 4.5K resolution, you get a really pixel dense clean image and running some tests of my own, the color accuracy and contrast is outstanding. You get the same 99% coverage of the P3 gamut as on the MacBooks with just over an 1100 to one contrast ratio, which is above average for an IPS panel. And something that I really like about the iMac over the studio display is it has much better black and gray uniformity. I've already had the panel in my studio display replaced once because of this and it still isn't great, but that is an issue on those monitors where you can often see some light bleed in the corners on dark content. This iMac is way better in that regard and I don't see any issues there. It also gets relatively bright going up to 500 nits so you should be able to see this just fine in most cases. And if you do have trouble with reflections and things of that nature, you can upgrade this to the nano texture glass for an extra $200. But I would definitely recommend going into the Apple store to check it out before you buy it. I mentioned this last week, but I personally don't like nano texture because of the softness it adds to the picture and the speckled RGB look it gives off over white content. I just find smooth glass is a lot cleaner, but nano texture can make sense in the right circumstances. Regardless, the picture on here is great in pretty much any scenario, whether that be for work or watching content, which is enhanced quite a bit by the sound in the M4 iMac. Inside here, there's a six speaker sound system with force canceling woofers that has amazing detail and clarity given how small of a space they're packed into. The iMac also supports Dolby Atmos and spatial audio. The volume gets louder than I would ever use at my desk. And at the other end of the spectrum, for capturing audio, you have a studio quality three mic array built in here that sounds great. You probably won't notice much of a difference compared to the last couple of generations there, but if you're on a call, you might notice the upgraded webcam that does look a bit better than the M3 iMac and now has center stage, which I find quite helpful on a desktop setup like this. On previous iMacs, I found that I had to adjust the tilt of the screen to line myself up better on camera, but with this I no longer have to do that anymore. The camera also supports desk view, which shows an image of what's in front of you with the same camera, but I find that more gimmicky than anything. With that said, the most important updates on this year's iMac in my opinion are the jump to that M4 chip and the increase in RAM on the base machines going to 16 gigs from eight at no extra cost, which gives you a lot more value and makes them a lot more viable for a lot of folks. I've been able to do almost anything that I've wanted to do on here from graphic design, photo editing, coding, video editing, and some light 3D work. And I would say outside of bumping up the storage on these machines, the only time I think you really need more power than this is if you're running large scale or more demanding workflows. Chances are if you're in that demographic, you probably already have a decent idea of what your needs are and what kinds of specs you need. But if you do have any questions on the M4 iMac or the base M4 chip, please let me know in the comments down below, but that's all I have for you today. If you found this video useful or enjoyable, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech related content or help me build a tool that makes apps in your dock occasionally whisper, don't trust the trash can to unsuspecting users, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.